Hey, this is so cool. Um, we're going we're gonna to go ahead and transition here. And I, I do want to um, just like to welcome everybody who's also online with us here in Laramie, Wyoming. We love you and we appreciate you. And, and so today's kind of a unique morning because it's August 4th here in Laramie. And this is the time and season when everybody's out. So we get the opportunity to have a much smaller, more intimate gathering. So I'm excited to... Uh, actually sent, kind of switched some things up this morning and make it more um, personal and, and more time of connection. And so I'm loving the time of prayer we're having. And uh, it's cool to just have some acapella worship this morning. The sound glitched out. <laughs> so, but uh, Liz has a couple things she's going to share um, this morning. She's going to take up our offering and, um, and then share, her and Mark are going to share a couple things about uh, uh, opportunity for a missions trip in Guatemala. And then we're going to jump into the word. So. I just want to say thank you, Lord, for everything you've given us today, all the days we live here in your kingdom here. And, Lord, we are given the opportunity to um, give from our hearts, but give because we want to, Lord. We want to, you, we can't outgive you in everything you've given us. And, Lord, I just, I know it. This is our opportunity to give to further the kingdom here in Laramie to further Rock Church. We just we just freely freely give because we want to. Um, you've captured our hearts. You've given us so much, and there's um, so much we want to give back because it, we've been so blessed. And we thank you for this opportunity. And there might be a text to give. There it is up on the screen. You can do, and we'll pass the basket. Um, while we do that, uh, yes, in last year we started up again going to Guatemala. Come over here. She wants me to stand up. <laughs> um, uh, last year we started going to a mission trip in Guatemala. And we're going to do it again. We already have our dates set. It's again after um, Christmas, like the 20... Uh, 27th, I believe, to the... I have this pulled up. Um, 27th to the 7th. Oh, that's August. Wrong, wrong month, sorry. Uh, it's been less than 27. Yes, 27th. Oh, to the 4th. 27th of December to the 4th of January. So be praying to join our team. We would love um, the opportunity to send more than we did last year. We're starting earlier announcing it. We'll keep announcing, announcing it. We will have a fundraiser again for the supplies of building. I don't know what we're building <laughs> yet, but we will do something. It, uh, well, actually, the bunk beds are extremely helpful for the families down there, that might be our focus this time. Uh, last time we also did a roof, a porch roof, and gave out about 300 pairs of shoes in a couple of different villages. Uh, but we will uh, discuss that with the team as the team forms and decide what we really want to put our time and energy into. Uh, hopefully, uh, through prayer, we will get God's direction on that. Adults, kids are welcome, but kids have to have an adult with them and uh, all ages we're going to work well most all ages I don't know about the little little toddlers but we'll see who's all interested we'll start there and then we'll see how it works out all right and if you want information get in touch with Liz or I uh, in the meantime but we can publish more information um, in two weeks as we study the price of airfare and the, the cost of actually staying at the mission base and things like that. It'll be similar to last year. Thanks. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Yeah, so um, it's pretty cool to have this opportunity of, of starting to create a consistent touch point with uh, missions in Guatemala. And so I know the last trip was amazing. And so we want to we wanted to keep sewing into that. So help us spread the word about Guatemala Mission. So let people know, like, we're going there. Um, it's time to start planning. 
and uh, bringing the gospel to the nations. That's so cool. So yeah, okay. Awesome. So hey, one other announcement. Um, and uh, starting next week, we did want to let people know we we're going to be ramping up Kids Church again. We know we took a break this summer. Summer in Laramie is wild, but we are going to be starting that up. So <laughs> thank you, Asia, for your patience and just all the parents that have been asking, like, hey, when are we going to start Kids Church up again? It's going to start next Sunday. Um, and then the last thing, the last Sunday of August, we're really excited about this. We're going to just do an all worship Sunday morning with the emphasis of healing. Come on, amen. We're going we're gonna to move all the chairs and we're going to gather as a church family to worship the Lord and believe and contend for physical healing in people's bodies. So as we prayed a little bit this morning, okay, we, we want to encourage everybody to bring friends, bring family, bring people that need a touch of heaven, bring people who, like, man, I'm kind of at the end of my resources with, the, with medical uh, options, and I need God to touch my body because the Lord is healing today. He wants to heal. Um, I can tell you um, three different major testimonies in my own family alone where we've experienced supernatural healing. I mean, we're talking super natural healing where um, in, in my wife Amy. One time she had a lump in her breast. We were scheduled to go to surgery. We anointed her with oil. We prayed. The next day she goes to the, sur the surgeon. The day before she got the, the, the ultrasound, they confirmed it all. The next day she goes there. They couldn't find the lump. They had to call in the surgeon. He's like, I don't know where it is. I don't know what happened. And Amy's like, Jesus healed me. Jesus healed me. And he's like, I can't, I can't say he didn't heal you because it was there and it's no longer there. Okay? The Lord heals. And so we wanted to make space to just glorify the Lord and contend for healing. So let's, uh, we wanted to start getting the word about that on um, August 25th. So August 25th, Sunday morning. So, amen. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, this is going to be, this is going to be fun. So I'm looking forward to having a bit of like uh, uh, a discussion. Rather than a traditional teaching and preaching, I'm going to kind of take this word and I'm, hope, I'm hoping it really um, uh, becomes a little more personal. And, and, and it's more of kind of a Bible study since we have a smaller crew this morning. Um, so let's open our Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. And I feel like the Lord um, really wants to bring an impartation of Joy in the midst of challenging situations and peace in situations that normally wouldn't be peaceful. Okay? So, I believe Jesus made a way for his sons and daughters to live free of stress and anxiety. As a matter of fact, life in the kingdom is a life that is free from stress and anxiety. This doesn't mean the Christian life is free from trials, from hardships, from circumstances and situations that, di that don't go according to the script. It doesn't mean that life is not free from the, the, the trials of this world. But there is a place in the kingdom where as followers of Christ, where we can find so much life in Jesus that we can actually live free of stress and free of anxiety. How many would like that in your life? Raise your hand. Right? I don't, I don't know about you, but I, I want that for me. I want that for my kids. I want that for, for our people that, that to, to actually be able to go through life free from stress and anxiety. And Jesus made a way for us to do that. And so that, that's what we're going to talk about. I felt like the Lord really wanted to bring an impartation of joy where there may be low joy and an impartation of peace where there's lack of peace this morning. So we're going to end this um, releasing joy and peace. Um, so let's, let's open up, uh, go, to, go to Philippians 4. And where this word started coming 
um, alive to me is um, in the beginning of July, Amy and I had uh, um, an awesome opportunity where we were able to take 10 days to take our family up to the Tetons. And it's something we do every year. Amy grew up going to the Tetons in the summers, and it's a tradition we wanted to keep going for our kids. And this particular summer, we were really excited about it because we were going to take Annika and Adeline up the middle Teton. And so we, we've set up these rites of passages for our daughters because we, we really heard the Lord like, I want you to raise re regal women. We want them growing up in the presence of God. We want them growing up with the people of God, with the word of God. We want them in having um, experiences in life that's going to teach them resiliency and um, uh, teach them how to really overcome. And so this summer we set up, we set it up so we could take them up the, the middle Teton. And so in case you, you don't know what the middle Teton is, the Grand Teton is the highest peak in Wyoming. The middle Teton is just, uh, it's uh, right next to the Grand. And it's 12,800 feet. It's a huge, huge peak. And it's a very technical peak. There's a lot of snow. There's a lot of ice. There's a lot of falling rock. It's a true mountaineer's peak. And so while it takes a lot of planning to pull this off. Um, Elise was too small, so we organized it so Mary could come up, take Elise for two days, three days, and we would uh, take Annika and Adeline up there. Well, while heading up there, we're, I'm driving, it's not my diesel truck, it was someone else's diesel truck in their camper. They loaned it to us for the week, and it was super generous of them, super generous. Of them. While, while we're driving up there, we're getting over Togedy Pass, and then all of a sudden the engine light come, starts going blink, 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 and I'm thinking, oh no, this isn't my truck. This is like a $100,000 truck and the engine light is going off, I'm scared. And I'm starting to feel all this anxiety in my stomach and all this stress. And I'm feeling fearful the truck is gonna break for, for the person who loaned it to us. Um, Cause I promise them I'm gonna take care of, I'm gonna take good care of this thing. But then I'm also beginning to feel super fearful that we're not gonna be able to do what we wanted to do and enjoy the time we had. And I started feeling all this fear and anxiety. And so I pull over, I, I buy some, um, some supplies. I won't go into all the details. I refill one of the things that needed refilled. And by faith, I'm like, okay, well, let's just see if this will um, displace the death. It may, it may have bad death. So we're driving and driving, and the engine light is saying, you know, 30 miles till it goes to 60% of power. And we're not even at the, at the destination. I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, I don't know what to do. We're in the middle of nowhere. This is going to be bad. How many can relate to anxiety like this, right? It's like, oh, this is hard. This is scary. So as we're driving, um, in the truck, I go, okay, girls, like, let's read Philippians 4. So we read Philippians 4, and then in the truck, we just start giving thanks to God ahead of time for the answer he's going to give us. And then we're, we're, we're giving thanks. We're just thanking God. We're, we're thanking him for... Uh, he, he made this opportunity for us to be here. I mean, we don't have a truck and trailer. We got a truck and trailer, a, a RV camper, and he's going to finish what he started. As we're thanking the Lord and praying, we're driving, and then all of a sudden the engine light goes off and everything resets. And we're thinking, oh, man, this is amazing. Yes, thank you, Jesus. So then we get to the, R the RV park where we're going to park our RV, and then there's no campsites. And we recognize, like, there's no way we're going to get a campsite. So I'm talking with the camp host. We decide we're going to go down this way. We're going to wait it out. Then he looks at me and says, you know what? You have a beautiful family. Why don't you just park the RV here, and this person is going to leave tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. and then just roll right in. And we're just like, oh, man, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Here's my point. The Lord was making a way when it felt like there was no way. And it's, 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 it's these little things. It was a family vacation. But it was important to us, and it was important to him. And I felt the Lord, I'm, I'll never forget this, I was standing in, amongst all these trees, and I felt the Lord saying, Josh, I'm having, I want to start having a conversation with you around Philippians 4, and exchanging your anxiety for my peace. So that's where this came from. So let's, let's read this, and then we're going to go through this verse by verse. So um, would anybody want to read this in the mic? Um, Ashley, do you want to? Why don't you read Philippians chapter 4. Um, we'll read the whole thing, verse 4 through 7. Okay. So mine's the Passion's translation, just so you guys know. Uh, it says, uh, My dear and precious friends, whom I deeply love, 
You have truly become my glorious joy and crown of reward. Now arise in the fullness of your union with our Lord. And I plead with Yuda and Sin. I'm not sure how you say those names, to settle their disagreement and be restored with one mind in our Lord. I would like my dear friend and burden bearer to help resolve this issue, for both women have delightfully labored with me for the prize and helped in spreading the revelation of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my coworkers. All of their names are written in the book of life, be cheerful with joyous celebration in every season of life. Let your joy overflow and let gentleness be seen in every relationship for our Lord is ever near. Don't be pulled in different directions or worried by a thing. Be saturated in prayer throughout each day, offering your faith-filled request before God with overflowing gratitude. Tell him every detail of your life. Then God's wonderful peace that transcends human understanding will guard your heart and mind through Jesus Christ. Okay, stop there. Okay, that's the Passion Translation. That's a really cool one. Okay, who has uh, NIV? Debbie, will you read that in the NIV? Uh, verse 4 through 7. Let's go ahead and read that. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's, uh, let's, let's break this down verse by verse here. Okay, because there, there, there are what I call handrails to the Christian life Paul is giving us. So the, the term handrails, I used to work for a wilderness, uh, well, I still work for the wilderness ministry, but when we teach students how to travel through the wilderness, we teach them to lay out their maps, and when they came up with a rad plan, a route and description to get from point A to point B, they would have to identify their handrails that's gonna remind them where they're at. Okay, so they would look at a map, and they would identify places, okay, when the river turns at a hard right, that's one handrail. When I get to this place and I can see this mountain, I know I'm right here. That's another handrail. What we just read here is Paul giving the church two handrails to get you to the destination of grace, okay, of accessing God's operational favor and presence in your life. And the handrails are this. One's joy, the other is peace. Okay, so Paul is saying, listen, in the midst of hard circumstances, you need to get your handrails. Where are your handrails? Where is your joy and where is your peace? Because when you get, latch on to joy and when you latch on peace, what you will find is those two things will actually bring kingdom advancement in your life and get you unstuck. The context of Paul writing this is, is he's in prison. Paul's actually writing this wall in prison, and it's not prison the first time, it's prison the second time. Okay, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this context here. So he's, he's, he's equipping the church of Philippi, saying, hey, where are your handrails? When life is hard and full of challenging situations that don't make sense, that might be suffering, you need to find your joy and peace, because these are the handrails that are gonna bring kingdom advancement in your life. So let, let's break this down verse by verse. It's pretty fun. Okay, yeah, yeah, please do. Here, where's, where's the mic? I love this. What Bible translation is that? It's called the Mere Study Bible. The Mere, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and it says, joy is not a luxury option. Joy is your constant. Your union in the Lord is your permanent source of delight. So I might as well say it again, rejoice in the Lord wow. always. So, I mean, joy is who we are. That's who he is, so that's who we are. Come on. So it's not like it, it's not something that it comes now and then. No, it's your constant. It's who you are. It's who he is inside of you. So it's not an option, <laughs> and I love that. Like, 
No, that's I good. Just, did you want me to read that? Yeah, next why don't you finish reading that in that translation, then we'll break this down verse okay, by verse. Okay, this, kind of this kind of joy empowers you to show perfect courtesy towards all people. The, the Lord is not nearer to some than what he is to others. Let no anxiety about anything distract you. Rather, translate moments into prayerful worship and soak your requests in gratitude before God. And then, and is, did I, do you want me to seven? Or no, it's, uh, yeah, uh, that's good. That's good. Let's stop there. Yeah. Okay. So let's break this down. That's so good. Thank you, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. So the first command, the first hand row, rejoice in the Lord. All right. Paul is saying, listen, rejoice in who? The Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ. Rejoice in Jesus. And then he says, rejoice in the Lord always. So he doesn't say rejoice in the Lord once a week on a Sunday morning. He doesn't say rejoice in the Lord, you know, once a day. He doesn't say rejoice in the Lord when things are going well. Where does he say rejoice? Rejoice in the Lord always. Always spells all ways. In all your ways, we are called to express our joy that we have found in him. So we are a people that rejoice in the Lord always. And this word rejoice, it actually literally translates be exceedingly glad. Be exceedingly glad. So here is Paul. He's giving a command in, a, in the scripture in circumstances that are not exceedingly glad, but he's calling people to be exceedingly glad. So the question is, is how do you do this? How many have been in circumstances that are not exceedingly joyful and you're having a hard time finding joy? Raise your hand, right? Okay, we can all think of one. So for me, one of the best ways I've found in my life to manifest this command, to... to um, uh, uh, take charge in joy is actually go back to the very moment where I encountered the joy of my salvation. Does that make sense? So for me, what I do, I do this every day. When I get alone with the Lord, I actually don't start reading my Bible. You, we need to read our Bible. You need to get in the Word. I don't start there. I usually get a cup of coffee. It's early in the morning. And I, I stand up, I take some sips, and I close my eyes. And the first thing I do is I go back to the memory where I encountered him as my Lord and Savior. I go back to that moment where I knew I became born again, where he called me his own. And for me, it was when I was a little boy. I was five years old in this huge mega church. The children's pastor gave, gave an altar call if, if, the, if some of the kids wanted to give their lives to Jesus. And I remember sitting in back, and all of a sudden there was this prayer that rose up in my heart. And the prayer was, Jesus, I want to give you my life. And I realized when I said that, it wasn't me. It was actually him stirring that up in me as a little boy. And he came to me and said, I love you. I forgive you. It was that moment I experienced the forgiveness of my sin and the adoption of me as, as a son. And, and my life was never the same in that moment. It was, the, it was that moment I experienced the salvation of the Lord. So there are, there are times in life that we're going that we're maybe in circumstances or situations that are not joyful, just like Paul in prison. But we can always go back where, to the moment where we encounter the joyful one and we pull from his joy. And that's what that scripture is saying. Rejoice in the Lord always. Find your joy in him always. And so I'll read, I'll read a few verses about this. Psalms 13, 5 through 6. I love this verse. It says, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. What is David doing? He's rejoicing in the moment the Lord came to him and grabbed the hold of his life. Okay. Psalms 51. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Paul, or Paul, David actually wrote that scripture after he was exposed in his fall with Bathsheba. And he recognized, wow, one of the reasons why he fell 
to temptation is because he lost the joy of his salvation. Luke 10, 20, rejoice that your name is written in the land, book of life. So can you guys see how joy is a handrail to kingdom advancement in your life? And the, it, there's this command, rejoice in the Lord always. Well, how do we do that? Well, the, we always have a reason to rejoice. And, but but the, one of the starting point is going back to the moment we were saved. So this is a little secret and a little tool in your life. So here's what I want to do. I want, you, I want us to, we're going to pause right here and we're going to take a moment. I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to go back to the memory where you experienced the salvation of the Lord. Go back to that moment where you experienced his love, his forgiveness, and his adoption of you as his son or daughter, and remember how that felt. Now as you go back to that moment, I want you to notice the joy of the Lord in that. And now as you're experiencing the joy of the Lord in that moment, I want you to begin to thank him for that joy, for that connection, for that adoption, for that encounter. And just begin to thank him. Okay, let's go ahead and open our eyes. So would, would, can you guys just see how simple this is and how powerful of a tool this is? Just going back to the moment you were saved and experiencing that joy. Okay, it, would, can, could we just maybe have one person quickly, like uh, one or two minutes, just share that experience and, the, and what, what that joy you experienced in that? Anybody who would want to share that? Do you want, you want to share? Okay, tell everybody your name. Oh, oh, I don't think it's on. Okay. Uh, all right, Elena, you're right there. My name's Elena, and the joy of me singing Father Abraham. All right. I love that song. And you just remember the, encountering the Lord in that. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. That's so cool. It's that simple, right? Anybody else want to share a moment? Just there... Debbie, you want to share? Okay. This is extra special because my sister was there. It was the first time that we both accepted Christ at the mm. same exact time. And I just remember there was fire there and there were people that we knew around there. And we heard that you needed to ask Jesus into your heart. And that's when we did. We were at a youth group. We were in a mainstream church. We were at a youth group that wasn't mainstream. We were at a campfire. They were singing worship songs, and they did an altar call. And it felt so, you're outside, so it feels big, but it wasn't. It felt so personal. It, you could feel it. I could feel it in my heart. I, we were young. I don't remember how old. I think we were um, 11 and 10. Yeah. All right. And so, yeah, you could feel it in your heart.
heart, the joy in your heart. And so let, let me ask you a question, Liz. So you were, you guys were 10 and 11 years old. You experienced the joy of the Lord in that moment as a 10 or 11 year old. And are you able to experience that same joy today? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> every time you, every, when you're in the presence of the Lord, I mean, you just, it, it starts in the same place for me in my heart. And you could just feel it every time you're in the presence of the Lord, whatever you're doing, every time. See, what I want us to see here is the power of rejoicing in the Lord and the starting point of, of the, you know, when the Lord came to you and you experienced salvation. That wasn't just an event. That was an invitation of continual union with him where you can always live a life of exceedingly great joy because of the life you have in Jesus. Sometimes... The Christian life, in the Christian life, we just got to get back to the basics and rejoice in the moment we were saved. And we'll access the same presence that saved us. And God has saved us and he's in the business of saving us. So when we're in circumstances and situations that are not joyful, when we thank Jesus and, and exercise this joy of our salvation when he saved us, we'll find his saving power with us once again. Do you see this? Talk, talk in the mic. You, I experience it in sorrow, in happiness, because you're always, always in the presence of the Lord. Because he never forsakes you. So, that's what he wants. We can pull ourselves away from him, but he is always with us. So if you will pay attention in hard times as well as good, you will be in that presence. And it still will be that feeling in your heart, whether it's hard or good, but it's still that feeling. This is so, it's such a powerful tool. So so this, the, like, let's just keep going through these verses so we can um, be sensitive to time. So verse 5. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Okay, this is what Paul's talking about here. This is what we just did, that exercise. Okay. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Okay, let your gentleness be evident to all. That word gentleness is actually pointing to a confident strength and self-control. It's describing a person who doesn't have to fight their way through life, but actually lives a life of yielding to the lordship of Jesus and his goodness in their life. Remember, kingdom advancement does not happen through striving. It happens through yielding. And you can be gentle in life. You don't have to force your way through life. Okay, because gentle people don't force their way through life. They're, 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 they're self-controlled. They're calm, they're cool, they're collect. Why? Because they know he is with them. The Lord is near. The, the statement, the Lord is near, is the exact same declaration Jesus gave the disciples when he sent them to go preach the gospel in dangerous environments. He said, when you get there, announce the kingdom is here. The kingdom is at hand. In other words, the realm of the king is within arm's reach. All you have to do is reach out and grab him. Rejoicing in your salvation is one of the ways you reach out and you grab the nearness of Jesus. Am I making sense? It's not that hard. It's not complex, but it's an extremely powerful tool. Because when you grab him, when he grabbed a hold of you in your adoption as a son or a daughter, that, same, that saving presence is still with you. Got it? Okay. So let's keep... Uh, Jennifer, please feel free to add. Like the, the, I, love, I love in this small setting we can add like this. That's the difference. That's the difference for, by living from instead of to God. Because we already have these things inside of us. It's all right there. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and, and I think we strive and perform and try to get all the answers and do all this stuff. And, and God's like, Jennifer, I'm right here. I'm right here. Yeah. And so that, that's, there's a huge difference between knowing and trying to become. Yes. Living from and living to. Yeah. Big difference. Big difference. Yeah, and I think this point, living from victory, we have to understand that um, there was never a situation in the scriptures that Jesus entered into and then walked away and said, I can't handle this one. There was never a situation in the recorded life of Jesus where he walked in and said, this is too big for me. He raised the dead, he healed the sick, he casted out demons, he paid people's bills. Peter, him and Peter owed taxes. He said, hey, grab a fish, I'm going to pay your bills, okay? He, he, he dealt with the city problem. He dealt with the relational conflict in families. There was never a situation Jesus walked in and left saying, I can't handle this one. There was always a redemptive solution. So when we touch the joy of our salvation who saved us, we're going to find that continual saving and redemptive solutions coming in to our lives, every circumstance, situation. But to, to, to see this, we, I think it's important we understand we need to grab a hold of the handrail of joy and then the next handrail of peace. Because when we grab a hold of that joy of our salvation and then the peace of Christ, it puts us in the venue of faith that accesses grace. Okay, so let's keep going here. All right, let's keep reading. Um, verse 6, do not be anxious about anything. Okay, stop there. All right. How many love this command in the scripture? <laughs> How many are good at this command? Yeah. Yeah. Let's grab the mic. Go ahead, go ahead and grab the mic. Is this thing on? Yeah, it's on. Go okay. ahead. I want you to define anxiety because I work in the medical profession in a level one trauma hospital. There are times when I would say I feel anxious because somebody is in our trauma room and is gushing blood all over the place and I can't thaw and prepare products fast enough. Right. It gives me to save that person's life. It gives me, I'm having it right now, an adrenaline rush. I, I mean, I'm always praying, and that energy empowers me. It's not just the adrenaline rush, but it's Christ working in me, empowers me to think clearly, to move quickly, to make decisions, mm -hmm. decisive decisions that I need to make in that mm -hmm. moment to help mm -hmm. save that person's life. Mm -hmm. So in that case... I don't know, maybe I shouldn't word, use the word anxiety, but it's a positive thing. Mm -hmm. I feel an anxiousness mm -hmm. that gives me energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I need you to define that a yeah. little. And I thought of Jesus in the garden sweating drops of yep. blood. That was not pleasant. Yep. He called out to the Father. He said, whatever he said, you know, if this is your will, then let it be done. I'm surrendering to you. So there was that constant connection mm -hmm. between him and the Lord, the, the Father God. Mm -hmm. So I need you to define this a little bit more about anxiety because I don't want to shut down a difficult emotion that's God-given yeah. that propels us to the appropriate action. Yeah, and I think, I think this is actually a really, really good distinguishing because Paul isn't talking about those healthy, um, healthy fear responses. Not all fear is bad, because fear actually drives you to action. Fear, healthy fear, okay? Um, the, anxi the, the word anxiety here is, is I, I, would, I would say it's, and it's, by the way, it's not, I don't think it's a sin to have an initial fear response. It's like, oh, wow. I mean, that's just, it just is. That's the human experience. But it's, it's that pro, it's, I think it's referencing prolonged fear, prolonged unbelief prolonged stress right and so um what what paul is referencing here is that um 
that, that, that state of mindset and that attitude that keeps us in unbelief and in fear that God is good and he's going to make a way. And so it's, it's the antithesis, antithesis of faith. So if in your situation as a medical professional, you're feeling nervous and afraid, but that's actually moving you towards faith, okay? What Paul is referencing here is when you're moving away from faith and, and living in hopeless despair, and that's the difference. And so, um, so, so we're going we're gonna to get into this because um, the anxiety, and the, the, I won't go because of time, there, 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 there's a whole bunch of scriptures that talk about pro- t- protecting the momentum of your heart. So Proverbs 4 talks about this when he said to, um, Solomon wrote to his sons and daughters, guard your heart for out of it sh- um, flows the issues of life. That word guard, it literally means to be a soldier that protects the ment- momentum of your affections. So, um, so what happens, Paul's referencing that prolonged stress. That prolonged anxiety, that's what he's referencing. You don't have to live in prolonged anxiety and stress because that's going to keep you from living out your God-given potential. Um, so, so I'll say this. Paul is saying it's possible to live stress-free and, and, and uh, to live free from anxiety in the Christian life. Okay, the, it's the prolonged. Um, so I, I wrote a couple no- notes here because as I was thinking of this, I really believe the enemy is working hard to keep the body of Christ in a prolonged state of anxiety and stress. Because if you can get the people of God to to, kind of live in this place of constant fear and constant unbelief, you'll get them to to, um, miss living in a place of maturity and health. And when you don't live in maturity and you don't live in mental and emotional health and you're filled with anxiety and stress, you actually lose the ability to be the creative expression that Jesus made you to be on this earth. So in your case, as a medical professional, you're, you're operating in that creative expression who he's called you to be. But the prolonged fear and stress, what happens is unbelief and fear begin to take over people's minds, their mindsets, their thoughts, their attitudes, and their lifestyle, and they quit believing and walking out the God-given potential of who he's made them to be. They become distracted. And the stress and the anxiety just build up in your body. And it's just not good. And the body keeps score. Yeah. The, so the, the stress builds up in your body. And you begin a host of stress and unbelief rather than freedom and hope. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, right? <laughs> right? Okay, so let, let's, let's just keep going here for the sake of time. So it says, be anxious for nothing, okay? This is so good. But in every situation, in every situation, what? By, what does it say? Prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ. Okay, let's break this down. Don't be anxious about anything. How do you not be anxious about anything? Through prayer. Did it, you see that? It starts with thanksgiving. It's, that's what it starts with. But it also is prayer right. and petition. But thanksgiving, giving thanks yeah. in every situation. Yep. See, th- this is it. This is it. So, be anxious for nothing, but in every situation, by, lift one hand, prayer and petition, prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. Okay. I want you to hear this. Prayerlessness is costly. Prayerlessness is costly okay so say that with me prayerlessness is costly okay James 4 says this you have not because you ask not all right the implication of this verse is actually prayerlessness can create lack 
See, many times we, there, there, there's a theology out there in the body of Christ that says lack is part of God's sovereignty. But last time we checked, everything has been purchased at the cross. Everything has been done and sealed at the cross. Why? Okay, why, why, why is prayerlessness costly? It's because when the people of God are caught up in fear and anxiety, they lose sight of, the, of faith and operating in their God-given identity and authority that's been given to them through the body and blood of Jesus. So, in Matthew 26, we find Jesus practicing prayer and thanksgiving in some of the most hell in, in the most hellish situation a person could ever encounter. At the Last Supper, he's with his disciples. Okay? He's having a dinner with them. He knows he's about ready to be betrayed by Judas. Okay? He knows John, one of his best friends, is going to abandon him. He knows Peter the Rock is going to abandon him. He knows all the disciples are going to leave him. He knows he is going to suffer a hellish, hellish death. He's going to suffer a criminal's death. And he knows he's fully innocent. He came to offer his life as a ransom, the perfect lamb. He knows all this is coming. And what does he do? He gives thanks. So I'll read this. In Matthew 24, or 26, he said this. While they were eating, Jesus took the bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take it and eat it. This is my body. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks and offered to him saying, drink, drink from it, all of you. What was Jesus giving thanks for? The hour of the new covenant has come. What do we give thanks for? The hour of new covenant is here. We always have a reason to give thanks to God because we are a people who live in the new covenant. We live in constant connection with him. Therefore, we can always give thanks. So prayerlessness is costly. It's costly. The Bible teaches us, that Paul teaches us, we don't approach the throne of grace with an inferiority complex. We actually approach the throne of grace with what? Confidence. And we give thanks. Mark 11, 26, these are the words of Jesus. He says, when you ask for things, believe God that it's already done. So you can actually thank God in advance for the breakthrough that's coming because you live in the new covenant. So prayer and thanksgiving is critical to the Christian life. So can you see the handrail of joy? Can you see the handrail of now peace coming? How does peace come? Through prayer and thanksgiving. Okay, so let's, let's keep reading here. So through prayer and thanksgiving. So let, let me just unpack this. So one thing I do is I, I rejoice in my salvation, okay? And when I pray, I start with thanking the Lord for all the good things in my life. I start thanking him for his blood and body. For the promise of the new covenant. Okay? And then it says, present your request to God, and then, and the peace of God. Okay, whose peace? God's peace. Okay, is God freaked out about your circumstance or situation? No. Is God afraid? No. Does he have peace? Yes. Now, this word peace it actually um, points to the Hebrew word shalom. The word shalom, you ready for this? Means the spirit that brings order to what is chaotic. Did you hear that? The word shalom is the spirit 
that brings order to what is chaos. So the word shalom is this incredible word in, 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 the, in the scriptures. It, there's many things it means. But the overarching word, is it's, it, it literally means the spirit of God that brings order to what is chaotic. It means to bring wholeness again. It means to bring peace. It means to bring um, healing. It means to bring health. It, it means to bring life. So when two kings would, go, um, would greet one another, the way they would greet one another, they would ask, how is your shalom? Are you feeling whole? Are you feeling complete? Are you at peace? Because kings were always dealing with problems and issues. But even in the midst of problems and issues, they, could, they would ask, how's your wholeness? That's what shalom is. Okay, so, so when we come to the Lord, we rejoice in our salvation. We come to him in prayer and thanksgiving. We now experience his peace. We experience the spirit of God that brings order to what is chaotic. Now that is amazing. Can you see how it's possible to live a life free from prolonged stress and tr prolonged anxiety because of who we have been made in Jesus Christ? This is so good. This is so good. This, th this is the good news. This is the good news of the gospel. People who get this play, get this revelation, will cause businesses to go to, go to a whole other level of um, a productivity. Parents who can walk in these things where they protect their joy and they protect their peace will go to a whole nother level of raising children in the way they should go. Okay, so let's keep reading. And the shalom of God, the spirit that brings order to what is chaotic, okay, which transcends all understanding. All right, how many of you ever met that person who's j so joyful in circumstances and situations and you're like, what is going on? Okay, they're above it. All right, how many have ever met that person, they're so peaceful and you're like, man, why are they so peaceful right now? Why? It's because they're, they're, they're manifesting their union with him. Will guard your heart, what's heart? Your affections and your mind, your thinking. Your emotions in Jesus Christ. The power of joy and the power of peace. Amen? You guys like breaking down this verse by verse? All right. So here's what we're going to do. It's 1130. It's fun to do this Bible study together. So I'd like to close like this. I want to just um, uh, uh, pray for a grace to go to another level of joy and peace. And so um, the homework I want to give everybody tonight is identify, identify one or two things that is causing you prolonged anxiety and stress. All right? First Name it. What is causing me prolonged anxiety and stress? And then the second part of that is you're going to take that, that, that thing that is causing prolonged anxiety and stress, and you're going to go to that connection point where you first met the Lord, where the joy of your salvation was so alive. And you're going you're gonna, to, I want you to experience that. And then I want you to give God that thing that is, causing anxiety and stress and thank him for the breakthrough that's coming. And then after that, let the Lord give you his peace. Receive his peace. Yield that your prayers have been answered. Yield to that. Yield, that, yield to the place the solution is coming. Yield to the fact that his shalom is your inheritance. The spirit that brings order to what is chaotic. Can we do that? All right. All right, let's grab hands.